with Paige May, founder of Asada's Daughters. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so you founded Asada's Daughters in 2015. So can you just give us a brief history of the organization and then talk about the work that you are doing today? Yeah, Asada's Daughters grew out of um, the moment of, of like, like 2014 where Black Lives Matter, right, is taking off. I was a part of something called We Charge Genocide uh, that grew out of the response to the murder of Dominique Damo, uh, also known as Damo uh, Jr. And I was a part of all these meetings and marches and um, there were, that were being led by adults, right? Um, uh, and there was more and more, I mean, there's always been youth organizing and there's always been youth orgs, uh, but there, at the time there was just, I, I recognized a gap for programming and organizations for people under the age of 18 to be able to participate in, uh, where they could participate in the Black Lives Matter movement in meaningful ways, because they would come to the protest signs that were often written by other people, right? And then I was like, what's the debrief happening here? And if you look at the history of movements, young people have often been right, at the forefront and in leadership, but it's not just act like, no, that doesn't happen to anyone by chance, right? That there's, there's uh, an important piece of intergenerational intentional organizing to support youth leadership, to make sure that folks understand why we're protesting, how we're protesting, right? And, and, and what comes next. Uh, so that was what it grew out of. And since then, I mean, it's evolved a lot. Um, and it's become this organization that organizes young people in the Black radical tradition and, uh, and you know, offers training and, and, or, and campaigns for young people to participate in. But also, uh, we have a whole section of work that we call revolutionary support, which now I think people understand is mutual aid, where we're thinking about uh, making sure that the folks that are helping campaigns and that are a part of our organization have the, the uh, other resources that they need to survive, right, and to uh, to be able to keep showing up for the movement. Um, yeah, so there's there's many components. We have a big garden now um, that uh, we grow food to give away to our neighbors, um, and yeah, so that's some of the the history of how it worked, of how we've come to where we are. Yeah, so talk about some of the programs that you guys have right now. So we have year-round political education for our members, and so that uh, for folks that are new, we have a program called Circles, and also for folks that have been with us for a long time, it's also Circles. Um, and so Circles is, is uh, though it's designed to be a space where folks can kind of enter into our community and see what we're about. And so every week we're talking about a different thing. Um, they are gendered, so we do have programming for cis boys as well, um, and, and cis guys. Uh, and, and so it's a space to talk about things that are coming up in people's lives, um, to connect to current events, but to do so in a way where we're talking about it in circle and so you're getting introduced to these ideas of like how we talk through hard things and that then when there's conflicts uh, we have the muscle right and we know how to how to do that um, without leaning on maybe uh, more dysfunctional ways of responding to conflict and so um, that's one of the programs that we have uh, we also are this fall will be uh, getting into our fall unit of Asadi University which goes more in depth and sort of black history um, and units of, of uh, to help develop analysis around black queer feminism. Um, this summer, we're, uh, we have our garden program that's running right now, our food justice program. And so we have a crew of young folks that are going through a curriculum around food justice and helping grow food in the garden. And we also, this summer, started a, we've always had sort of a cabinet of supplies that folks could access, even if they weren't a part of our organization. But this summer, we actually, in our garden, have a, a, a like a supplier, what we call a redistribution site. So we have three, uh, throughout the week, donations are dropped off by volunteers from all around the city. And then three days a week, we have a table and we have young folks and staff that are helping to, um, yeah, manage that. And so we have neighbors, uh, it's, we don't advertise it anywhere. It's just for our community. And so folks are coming through and getting everything from toilet paper to, you know, fresh veggies and produce to baby food, lots and lots of diapers to information about campaigns and like the defund flyers and things like that. Mm -hmm. Young people have been incredibly, they've been at the forefront of this whole movement. And do you see that as being unique to the moment or do you see that as being kind of part of the historical tradition of organizing? I think that's a part of the historical tradition. So I'm, yeah, I'm very inspired by the NAACP Youth Councils. And so this is something like, you know, in Chicago, people often talk about, you know, Fred Hansen is like this example of like youth leadership, right? Um, 
And I, again, challenge us to think about youth to be even younger than, like, with the Fred Hampton that people are talking about, who's, like, in his 20s, like, early 20s, of course. Um, but the Fred Hampton was organized to the NAACP Youth Council. So when he was in high school, he was a part of these, this organization run by the NAACP where he was getting introduced to canvassing, right? He was getting introduced to press conferences and things like that. Um, so that by the time, you know, the, the, Black, the Black Power movement is happening, right, he has a foundation. Um, and that's why he's part of why he's able to so quickly, you know, uh, become a leader and um, such a great and amazing leader, you know, um, is because he actually had been organizing for years, but by the time he's 21. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, the, the NAACP Youth Councils were, uh, were something that I read about a lot. Um, and, and they had been around for quite some time by the time Fred Hampton comes into them. And they, they still exist, although I think they're different now. Um, there's the first mass march in the United States, as we know it, um, is, you know, uh, is an anti-lynching march and it has thousands of people and they're all dressed in white and the front of the march is children. Um, the example that I usually talk about in workshops is the children's march that happened in Birmingham. And so this is uh, at a time when Birmingham, you know, you have Bull Connor, it's like, the sort of scene as like the, the epitome of Jim Crow in the South is what's happening in Birmingham. And the movement there has been really deflated by the, the intense repression and Unre uh, unrelenting brutality of, of, of white supremacy there. And so they, you know, the, uh, a reverend, uh, Bevel, asked for MLK to come in to kind of help inspire a, a resurgence of movement. Um, and MLK, you know, has th this big speech at a church and it's like, who will go to jail? Who will fight back and is willing to go to jail? And only children stood up. And he said, no. He said, no, we're not doing that. And he was wrong. And I, I think that's important to recognize that, like, and to, to give him grace. Like, people get to be wrong, you know? And, and, um, and he did not want to use children, right, and have children be have dogs put on them, right? Um, but uh, the reverend and the young people were insistent that they wanted to do this and they understood what it meant. And there was intense training that happened. Not it. it wasn't just, okay, so now we're going to just have a big protest and we'll invite all the children. They, it was weeks of planning and training. Um, and you have over the course of, uh, I believe, four days, thousands of young people, some as young as eight years old, going, just filling the jails. They had to uh, repurpose a, a fairground to turn it into a jail because there were so many young people. They didn't have enough room in the cells. Um, and it flipped, uh, yeah, I mean, it flipped Birmingham on over on its head. There's so much that's cool about that march, also the way that like ra that radio DJs were a part of it. Anyways, it's, there's a really great documentary folks should look that's on Vimeo. It's called The Children's March. Um, and what you see is, I mean, that it creates international shame because, you know, I'm okay was right in that they set dogs on children. They put fire hoses on them, and they showed up the next day with bathing suits on. But uh, that, those images of the brutality being used against children um, made the president look really bad. And he was like, "All right, we got to do what you need to meet with us. We got it. What, what do you want?" And this this is one of the the final straws uh, that that leads to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Um, is is that that action, um, which? I mean, you had young people at one, on one side at one point with MLK on the other, right? Uh, and I, and I, he, he changed his mind, I think, is my understanding. But yeah. Uh, so it's, the, every era, every movement has had um, young people in it, having leadership, but I think we always have to see the ways that intergenerational support played a role. Um, and that whether you're young or you're just new at any age, there's, it's important to have training, it's important to have mentorship, right? Those are, those are how we build succession into our movements. So a big focus of the work that Asada's Daughters has been doing is the Cops Out of CPS or the Police Free Schools movement. So talk about that and then comment, obviously, on the four to three school board vote in June. Yeah. So this is actually a very... This demand has been around, I mean, for as long as police have been in schools, of course, but I remember, you know, I, I've been in Chicago 10 years this fall, and the first time I ever passed out flyers that I remember was, it was Counselors Not Cops, um, and it, it was, uh, yeah, it was a campaign, I believe, led by Project Mia, um, that was, yeah, fighting to get cops out of schools and to use that money and resources to have counselors. Um, and so that demand has been around for a long time and organizations like Brighton Park Neighborhood Council and STOP um, and Lasse and, uh, have been 
really pushing for this, uh, this, this campaign specifically for the last two or three years. Um, I've laid a lot of really important groundwork that I, I want, like, the, there was recently, like, a hearing uh, in city council, and they were talking about the Office of the Inspector General report, which we were like, that's an old report, we've done a new one, but, like, BPNC is why that OIG report even existed. Like that comes because of organizing pressure, right? Um, that we even have these things that only now, two years later, city council is finally like looking at. Uh, so anyways, uh, uh, we've been involved in the campaign for over a year. Um, and it's exciting because we've entered uh, we, into this work um, and immediately were aware of all the other cities that were, were also organizing to get cops out of schools. And so there's this rich ecosystem of, of people that are, that are making these efforts and that are in conversation with each other and also that have won, you know? Um, and so th there, there's precedents and there's things that we can look at to try to help shape our own movement. But everything changed with Minneapolis. <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the process that we thought this was going to take um, shifted a lot when Minneapolis, Minneapolis literally overnight got theirs canceled. And it just, the, the political conditions have changed. And I think anyone would tell you that, even the mayor, right? Um, and although, and so, I mean, gosh, there's so much to say, but like, Lori Lightfoot ran on a promise that she would get cops out of schools. That was a part of her transition team, like all those things. And now she's staunchly saying, we are not gonna do that, right? I mean, we're not surprised. Uh, uh, we knew we were aware that Lori Lightfoot was not who she was saying she was at the time, and we're trying to warn people. Um, but uh, it's still a fight. It is, and Chicago, I mean, Chicago's the only major city that has made no changes. Like, no, they've done nothing. Um, it, it, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know how Lori expects Chicago to maintain its reputation as a progressive city the way that this is going down. Um, I think that, yeah, Chicago's gonna, has to understand, like, this is a, a an extremely anti uh liberal, anti-progressive, whatever you want to call it, place. Um, and you see that in, in, in what it's taken to get the most basic of things, like a statue taken down, and now she's saying even that's not real, it's just a temporary safety precaution. So anyways, the campaign. Um, yeah, so everything has changed uh, and, and escalated, but in, in really important ways, where um, on their side, right, like the people who actually have the power to make the decision, we're seeing things like the historic vote with the Board of Ed, we're seeing things like um, aldermen ha and, and the mayor having to talk about it when they would prefer to just not and ignore that it even exists. And also on our side, where I think you'll see that the ways that we are organizing to get cops out of schools have become more and more explicit as like a part of a larger movement for abolition, right? And that this, this is not, so this is not the low hanging fruit. This is step one of defunding the police, right? Um, that this is this is not even the minimum. This is like should have been done. Can't believe we're still talking about it. Uh, this is embarrassing. Like you all, you all should be embarrassed that this hasn't happened yet. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think and the city is trying to. It's a battle over like what is the problem, right? And they are saying that this is the problem is is school control and that this needs you know. They're trying to say that this is a question of how democracy should function and that we should leave it to the LSCs. And nothing about this moment is how democracy should function. Like, black young people should not have to be protesting during their summer vacation. Black and indigenous people should not have to be getting bloodied by police. Like, nothing about this is how things should be working. Um, and that LSCs are not democratic institutions. They are institutions that uphold the power structure that exists, which is an inherently undemocratic white supremacist one. Um, and so what we're seeing is uh, LSCs are um, the ones that can even function and that can have a quorum um, if they are at a majority black school are not getting rid of cops and the ones that are at non-majority non black uh, students are more likely to vote to get rid of the cops. It is unclear what happens with those police officers because uh, Lori Life has made it quite clear that she is opposed to canceling the contract because CPD needs that 33 million. Um, and so that 33 million is gonna get paid for and those cops are gonna be hired and I'm assuming they're just gonna get sent to the black school. So what, uh, the fight now is to not make it even more unequal and that's why we have to center blackness and black students because if we don't, we're actually setting ourselves up to just have more more highly policed black CPS schools when they do open. That was a very long answer. Um, that only well, no, because that's because that's what I was going to ask you next. Is that so? Now that local school councils are making those individual votes, 
but the contracts still remain. So it's not as though those funds are then being redistributed. So, I mean, do you see that? Do you see the LSC, like removing cops from individual schools? Obviously, you don't see that as being an adequate step. I mean, the school, wait, so uh, Denigma Howard, was this last school year? Um, Denigma Howard was brutal, was a student at Marshall High School who was brutally assaulted by police officers at her school. And her father has been extremely vocal about how awful that was and his demand is that cops that the only response is like well there's many responses but one of them has to be cops should not be in schools uh, Janina Howard uh, she had uh, she had an IEP um, she had needed I'm trying to remember all of the details you can read about what happened to her but it was just something that wasn't even a problem like should have never been no one needed to get in trouble right that was escalated to her being brutally attacked and tased, um, stepped on, hit, bruised uh, by police officers that were in her hallway. Um, and that school spent 10 minutes, that, uh, that school, when they, they had an LSC vote about whether or not to remove cops from schools, they deliberated for 10 minutes and voted to keep cops inside of schools. So like that, if that's like the epitome of the school that like we need to get, like this should have happened, that's what we're seeing is taking place. Um, yeah, uh, and you can look, I mean, we have, we've been publicizing, like you can now look into all these schools and see the records that these cops have. Cops are sent to work in CPS as like a punishment. It's like, this is the, like, if you're ever gonna talk about bad cops, which I think is not the point, like it's not about good cops versus bad cops, it's about policing. But if you're gonna stop to talk about the bad cops, those are the ones we're sending to people to school, right? Um, again, the problem is not that what cops we're sending there, it's the idea that we need cops stationed in schools, so I don't wanna go too far down that road. Um, but the school that has cops that do that on full display, it gets talked about in the Tribune, like all the, all the news outlets are talking about it, and you still spend 10 minutes being like, yeah, Let's keep doing this. This makes sense. Um, and I, I think I skipped a few steps, but essentially the campaign initially was trying to go through the Board of Education because the contract that put CPD inside of Chicago Public Schools was signed by the Board of Education. That's who the agreement is ultimately between. Um, and they, uh, LSCs can vote to get cops out of their schools. That does not break the contract. It keeps the agreement in place between CPS and CPD. And LSCs don't have the power. When they do that, they are walking away from whatever money is going to have those cops in their schools. They're just saying, we, they're just letting it go. Um, and, and it doesn't cancel the money that gets sent to CPD, uh, but the school is, that has no way of choosing how it might get. It doesn't have a way to end that, that, that money uh, transaction or, or to decide where it would go instead. Um, only the Board of Ed can do that. The Board of Ed has the power to decide we're breaking the contract and we're going to reinvest that money into counselors, into nurses. Again, the, many schools only have a nurse on like Wednesday. Like that, that, that's the conditions that we're in. Um, they have how many students per teacher? I mean, it's outrageous. There's, there's so much um, that we're being told there's not enough money for and yet we're paying 33 million to have awful cops inside of schools. Um, the other thing that's happened is that there's since been, it's been introduced to city council, where we have, have something like 15 aldermen that have signed onto an ordinance to get cops out of schools. Again, Lori Lightfoot and her people have tried to kill that bill, but have killed that ordinance by putting, sending it to rules committee. The thing about city council is, again, they, they, unlike the LSCs, they do have the power to cancel the contract, but even city council can't decide that that money would get reinvested. Right, that's only the Board of Ed. And so what's confusing for folks is there are sort of three targets. There's individual LSCs, there's city council, and there's the Board of Ed. And the campaign has stayed rooted in this, we need to win through the Board of Ed. That is where we can actually see the, in, the divest and invest that we need. Um, uh, but, and the LSCs, but you know, we're organizing students that are in these schools where LSC votes are happening uh, because it's a part of the movement that we're in uh, to challenge the, the momentum of, of what's happening where just young black people are just being completely thrown under the bus. Uh, and so we wanna, in all of these LSC votes, even when we lose, it's important that we fight back. But the, clear, the target is clearly the Board of Ed. Right, and so the Board of Ed vote is coming up as well as the vote in city council. Yeah, so the this, the Board of Ed is supposed, yeah, we'll vote on, I believe it's August 26th, um, for the second time, um, and this last month we had a vote, and if, 
first of all, the fact that the vote even happened shows you how different of a moment we're in. It would have taken us, at like, I don't know, another year, let's say, to get them to vote on it, of, of building, to be able to build enough pressure to get them to vote on it. And we got three of the seven to vote to get cops out of schools, which is just, the Board of Ed is a rubber stamp for Lori Lightfoot. Like, they, they don't have split votes. Like, they just push things that Lori, the, whoever the mayor is, through. Uh, so that we had a split vote where oh, almost half, right, went against the mayor, who's lobbying them very hard. We know that she's in their ear trying to say, you need to keep cops in schools, they need that money, blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, that, that, was a re that was a really big deal. Um, and so we're expecting another vote. And, and we saw, uh, yeah, we're expecting another vote in August. We expect the three folks that voted with us to stay with us. Um, of the four that voted no, I mean, it's interesting. You could hear their comments. There are some that are just so deeply, they, they said a whole lot of nothing. I mean, um, they offered no actual argument for why. They, a lot, they, there was focus on like the community violence, which is like, what are you talking about? We're talking about schools. Um, uh, and, and, and like, what, how are police stopping community violence? I mean, if you just, whenever y'all see this, there was just a, a mass shooting on 79th Street. Um, the police were notified it was gonna happen, police were present, and they didn't stop it. <laughs> like, what about having police present has made people think that it will stop violence. We have more police per person than any other city in the world, and we are not the most safe city, right? Um, so we know that those things don't go hand in hand. So, so of those four, though, there are a few that we think are movable, uh, particularly Sent Hill. Um, so Sent Hill has, you know, he's on the last call, he was wearing a Black Lives Matter mask, which we're like, dude, what do you, we're telling you, Black Lives Matter equals cops out of schools deep on the police. Um, he's said, you know, uh, Sent Hill, uh, agrees that cops should not be stationed in school. Again, he's trying to make this a debate over process, um, and that's not what's actually happening. Like, this is a crisis. This is not a moment where we need to let individual places decide. This is anti-Black. This is racist. This is extremely messed up, um, and you have the power to make it right, and you, you have the responsibility as a result. Um, and so he needs to feel that pressure. He needs to understand that this is on him, um, that he he signed that contract. <laughs> he needs to, to unsign it, right, um, and to cancel it, uh, if he actually does believe that Black Lives Matter. Um, so yeah, that, that's what's coming up. For city council, it has to get moved out of rules. Um, that's going to be the thing, right? Uh, and so... Uh, the fight continues on both fronts. But um, for sure, Board of Ed, there will be a vote, and we are going to make sure that they feel the pressure. So following mass protests, we saw the city remove, as you said, temporarily statues of Christopher Columbus. But then in the same week, the Park District Board voted to change the name of Stephen Douglas Park to Frederick Douglas Park. So talk about the organizing that led up to that, and also the significance of symbolic action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so both of those things have years of organizing. Um, I, I used to work for Village Leadership Academy, so I'm like really excited and just like, oh, VLA. Like I, I know those students that, I mean, they've been fighting for this since they were, I believe when that started, it was the fifth grade campaign. Um, so it, started, it was a campaign started by fifth graders uh, with their teacher um, as a part of their homeroom grassroots campaign that they had to do, and that was, three, four years ago that they started that. Um, and it's been maintained by elementary school students, right? And, and school, again, intergenerational school support. So incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I think it matters, right? It matters that we win and that we celebrate that win. And that it matters that that happened because of young black people um, and that we make sure people understand that. This didn't happen because suddenly aldermen woke up and realized like, oh, slaveholders, we're wrong and we should not memorialize them in places, right? Like they did it because young black people made them. Um, and it mattered, and that's why we have to fight back and organize. Uh, the, the Columbus statue, again, indigenous people have been demanding that and organizing for that for years. Um, and, and that what's happening, and, and, and I, I say all of this like, and it matters that it happened, it's significant. Um, period. And we are absolutely in a moment where the power holders are trying to, part of what you're, you're when you're community organizing, you, you are trying to make the crisis that your people are going through understood as a real problem, 
right? And that you have to, part of it is you have to sh make the crisis either visible if it's not, although, or, or like, or like everybody else's problem, like, we, you know, and that this is why we do civil disobedience and we disrupt people's daily lives is because like our lives are disrupted and you all don't care. So we're, it's going to affect you until you, until our problem, because it becomes something that you want to see fixed as well. Right. Um, so anyways, what's happens, you know, because again, even Minneapolis, like that, that grows off of generations of organizing, right. It doesn't come out of nothing. Um, uh, but, but since Minneapolis and, uh, and the uprisings it's inspired, What's happening now is that everyone acknowledges there's a problem, right? And now power holders are trying to, we have to fight over how big is the problem um, and whether or not they've actually fixed it yet. So they're gonna give us symbolism. They're gonna, that, like that, they'll, they'll, that's the first concession um, and it matters. And it's good that, we're get, that, that we fight for it and that we celebrate that we're with those wins and we keep fighting. That we don't settle on just changes of names and new statues, but actual material power for our people um, yeah, period. So uh, I, I think, and, and what's beautiful is that both of those campaigns for Douglas Park and the Columbus statue are led by organizations and, and campaigns and coalitions of people that are firmly committed to uh, abolition, right? And, and that see that don't see this as, and now we're done and we're free, right? But that are absolutely on a pathway. Uh, where next step is, all right, now we're going to defund them through the, the city council budget process this fall. So that excites me, you know. Um, I, I don't see any of the folks that made these moments happen settling down. Um, and, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm super stoked about it. But but the symbolic thing, yeah, it, it's, it's real. Um, you saw Washington, D.C., right? They put Black Lives Matter on the street. Again, trying to just, like, get people to calm down. Like, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. And, you know, we're going to fix it. Look, here's a beautiful street mural. And then the next day, they added the equals deep on the police, right? Like, organizers did that. And I think just that push is important. Always push left of wherever, whatever they're giving you, say we need more. What do you see as the future of the defund movement in Chicago with the political atmosphere that we have right now? And then also, what is Asada's daughter's place within that movement? Yeah. So there is, I think there's going to be many defund campaigns. Um, you've got, you know, Good Kids Mad City has a demand to cut 2% of the budget to directly fund their, their Peace Book project, right? You're going to have other organizations, like I saw, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the, the exact acronym, but the, the uh, workers... Yeah, you're going to see other organizations that I think um, have, are, are, are naming cuts that need to happen to fund specific things. Um, I think you're going to see different percentages, right, of, of we need to cut it by this much and this much. You're going to see general defund, and we need that. We need, so, people often say, like, we don't want to recreate the wheel, word, but we also need many, many, many wheels on the road right now, and so this, this is a moment where we just need at all words and like people just out here demanding defund, 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 right? And and also fund this, right? And so what's happening is I think this this defund campaign, this this defund movement that I think citywide movement we're about to see, is landing in a place where for years now campaigns like No Cop Academy and Fire Servant and uh, um, yeah, uh, the, all the all these different campaigns have been trying to force the city to, to question what actually keeps people safe, right? Um, and that the, the idea, the myth that police keep us safe has started to crack. Um, and that this is a moment where, where that takes, that, that out of those cracks, like new things are growing and people are starting to really see that like more police does not equal more safety. Um, and so uh, this, this defund push is, is yes, like we wanna cut, cut, cut like a lot because we need a lot of money to fund other things. And that it's not, abolition is not just about negation and absence it's also about presence and building up new things and those things cost a lot of money it costs a lot of money to do what cpd does it's going to cost a lot of money to do the things that we actually need to be happening in our communities so i think this campaign is going to be a you know a divest invest campaign where we're, we're demanding we need community counselors and counseling 
We need, uh, you know, we need that money to go towards healthcare. We need that money to go towards housing. We need right, all of, we need that money to go towards addiction and rehab facilities for folks, right? All of those things actually help to get at the roots of, of, of the conditions that lead to violence, right? Um, we need, we need to invest in things that help uh, men talk through and, and, and grow different versions, that talk through toxic masculinity and grow alternative at masculinity, right? Um, all the, the, like actually asking our, ourselves as a city, like why does harm happen and why does violence happen? Um, and, and what do we need to build up? And, and cutting CPD's budget so that we can fund that work. So I think that's what we're, we're gonna see uh, campaigns that, that demand that. I, I'm, Asada's is a part of uh, defund CPD campaign that was seeded by a new sort of constellation or formation called BAN, the Black Abolitionist Network. Um, and so our members are already engaged in that campaign, helping to lead trainings out here canvassing, helping to lead actions. Um, and as a part of a campaign that seeks to become massive. Um, so th this campaign, uh, we're, we're really interested in getting thousands of people that are not just signed on, but are, that are active and that are engaged in the campaign. Um, through committee structures, right, and, and that are that are uh, connected and supported to also do their own things and their own actions and their own you know their own study groups and, and trainings with their friends and their people. Um, so I'm I'm super excited about what we're growing. We just had a, a beautiful march and rally and event on uh, the west side um, on Friday. It was the four year anniversary of Freedom Square, which again was that was oh gosh talk that was a really important moment I think in helping crack. The, the myth of policing and why we need it. Um, so anyways, for the anniversary of Freedom Square, um, yeah, there was like a, a, a big <clears throat> rally. I, I don't even know what to call it. it. It was gorgeous. There were tents with all different organizations tabling, giving away food, giving uh, talking about reparations, talking about um, housing rights uh, and resources. And they uh, and then we marched. Um, and I was, I, I do, I'm doing outreach for the campaign. So for the bulk of the rally, I stopped, I was standing by a stop sign and people would pull up and I make, I showed them I had a flyer and I passed out about 300 flyers over the course of maybe two, three hours to cars. And people were like, yeah, like they'd be like, what is this? I'm like, we're trying to defund the, you know, as much as you can say at a stop sign, I would get through my little spiel and people were hyped for it, you know? Um, and, uh, and then after we had this march and uh, we were, and it's normal to pass out flyers to folks that are sitting there. I've never had people so excited to get a flyer. Like <laughs> not one person said they didn't want a flyer. Not like that's never happened to me. Every single person that we went up to, and I was, I would be like, "Do you want a flyer?" Every single person said yes, and every single person, every single one was down to have a conversation. That's never happened to me before. I'm sure it's happened before, but I, I was, I'm still shook and like smiling from it. Um, and, and and those conversations are really important um, that because people are concerned about violence, right? And people are, people do, don't want just nothing, right? And usually that's all we're offered. I remember when Chuy Garcia was running it and he had the thousand more cops thing. And what we found is that when we went and talked to community members and we said, how do you feel about, you know, a thousand more cops? People would say, yeah. Cool. And I'd be like, okay, would you rather have a thousand more cops in your neighborhood or a thousand more jobs? Everybody said a thousand more jobs. So when you're offering nothing, right, but more police, that's one thing. But when you actually are having a conversation about what do you want and what do you need, what do you think will actually get to the root, people, this, this, people have so many ideas, right? Um, and this is what our government should be doing, is talking to community members about like, what do you what do you need, right? Um, and making those things happen. Uh, we're having to do it for elected leadership as organizers. Um, but yeah, so I, I think we're, this, it's, it's gonna be a, a campaign that, that has puts pressure on aldermen, but that also is in the streets talking to people um, about their experiences with police, about their experiences with violence, um, and, and what they think uh, we would have needed to be in place to have prevented that violence from even happening, so that police are just obsolete and, and unnecessary. Um, and people with guns and cages and all of those things, right? Um, so again, long answer, but that's that's where we're going. It's going to be massive. Um, we're going to be demanding massive cuts in CPD's budget because we need a lot. We need that money. Um, yeah, what we're seeing with coronavirus, like we need healthcare, we need rental assistance. Like there's so many things that we need and we're constantly told we don't have money, we don't have money. But we have $1.8 billion 
for the minimum of police, never mind all the extra ways that we throw money at them. I mean, that's just, they're not, they, they can't keep getting away with that myth. And I think that is going to, it's going to be, um, we're going to see them, uh, Lori, I think is, is, is going to, uh, people are going to see who she really is. And we've been telling you she's a cop. Um, and people are about to, if you haven't peeped that yet, you're going to see it very soon.